If a Bible open up to First Samuel chapter three is where we're going to be. First Samuel three. Uh, while you're turning there, let me just tell you, you might want like once you get it, you might want to just stick your finger in it because we're going to take the long way around setting it up. We're going to, I mean, we're going to read a huge chunk of scripture together. But I just need you to know that if I'm going on for a little bit, and you're like, did he forget? No, I'm the one who told you. I didn't. Forget. Of course not. Um, like what I want us to do is understand the story going into it. So we're going to recap First Samuel, this book that we're going through as a church uh, thus far. Um, so this is an interesting story. Today what we're going to read about is the calling of Samuel. We're going to read about when the Lord speaks to Samuel, he begins his ministry. And it's an interesting story because it's one where we typically, when we hear it recounted, we only hear about half of it. Like we hear, like maybe you, you grew up in church like I did, and you hear the story of, you know, like this little boy Samuel, and he's, and he's like, you know, he's asleep at the foot of the Ark of the Covenant, you know, and, and like the voice speaks to him, Samuel. You know, and there's the whole, like, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You know, it's this great story I heard in Sunday school. But the problem is the version of it that I heard in Sunday school, because the Bible is not a PG book, um, is, is one where uh, it tends to cut off halfway. And what we have to understand today is that this is actually a story about, and you can see on the slides here, Samuel versus the sons of Eli. And this is where, like, we, we typically don't get it a whole lot. Um, what, we do, what we do is, is we hear, like, the calling, and it stops. But this is, like, the calling comes as part of a much larger story. So let me say it this way. Um, one of the things that I've been discovering, co like, during COVID um, is, I mean, just one of the ways I think, like, that God is shaking up the church. Maybe you've noticed this, too, is there has not been a small amount of ministry scandals and leaders falling. Have you noticed that? Like, I've lost count, dude. Like, and I remember, like, like, there was the first one. I think the most notable first one was probably uh, Carl Lentz up at, up at Hillsong. And, then, I mean, but it's, it's been person after person after person. And, and like, to most notably, the, the now, after he's been dead, famed apologist, evangelist, Robbie Zacharias. Like, Robbie Zacharias, it appears as though after he died, came out, this man was a predator. Like, absolutely, he, like, he was living a double life. He was, he was preying on people's goodwill and trust, abuse like, across the board. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I hear these stories, first of all, yeah, obviously my heart breaks. My heart breaks for uh, Ravi's victims. It breaks for his friends and family who thought they knew him. Um, it breaks for, like, the impact of the kingdom of God, like, how that might affect people's lives. Because, I, listen, you know, sometimes you hear somebody, like, I don't know if you ever watch YouTube videos, right? And the person will be like, a lot of you have been asking me, right? And you're like, nobody's talking to you, man. You know, like, all right? So, but, like, but truthfully, like, and I, that's the boat that I think I'm in. I, not, people don't, like, a lot of people don't ask me anything. But, um, it's truth. Um, but I have had some people ask me, like, dude, what do I do with this Ravi thing? Like, this is a guy, like, I really looked up to. This is somebody who, like, really, really well defended the faith, like, who seem to know so much about like why it's reasonable to be a Christian, like historically speaking, based on the evidence, how could somebody who knows all this stuff be so duplicitous? Like who, how could somebody like who says like he loves God and wants to point people towards God, like live this double life of abuse, like for years and years and years and years? And, and by the way, what does God think about that? And the fun fact for you is, First Samuel begins telling you what God thinks about that. And we're gonna look at that today. We're going to look at this story of God going, uh-uh, not in my house, all right? And, and to understand that, okay, that's what the story of Samuel versus the sons of Eli is about. Now, okay, so let me set this up, all right? So if you were here last week, you know what happened. Okay, so Samuel is the son of this couple who couldn't conceive, right? Hannah and Elkanah, right? And Hannah, she prays. She's like, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll give him to you. Remember that story? Okay, and, and, and God goes, okay. All right, and so Hannah, uh, she's able to conceive. She, has, she gives birth to his son, Samuel, and it says this in 1 Samuel chapter one. It says, uh, starting verse 24, it says, after he was weaned, okay, so, you know, there's the baby Samuel, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephath of flour, a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. Now, I just want to pause here to understand what's going on, okay? So, she, okay, she's raised him, like, enough to the point where, okay, you know, like, baby doesn't need mom anymore as, as far as milk or anything like that. So, she's now going to take this young little boy and go, all right, I'm taking him to, to, to the temple. I'm going to fulfill what I said 
I would do. And by the way, how gut wrenching would that be as a parent? Right? But we're going to learn something about Hannah and her attitude that I actually believe bleeds into her son's outlook as well. And it's that she sometimes recognizes that, like, look, okay, my sacrifice is an opportunity to worship God. Sometimes what we do is we get so focused in on what we've lost or given up for the kingdom that we lose the joy that comes with the result of giving up for the kingdom. I don't know if that makes any kind of sense. Let me say it this way. So like Hannah and her husband, they go to drop off Samuel uh, at the temple. And when they go, like these details, like they're bringing a bull and they're bringing like this flower and they're bringing um, this wine. That They're telling you something about like where their hearts are at. So just a fun fact for you, okay? So here's this couple that if they were just to leave their firstborn son, that would be enough. Right? Like, my gosh, I wouldn't do it. I'm just, I'm just being honest, okay? But they do, but then they bring a bull. And what they're showing is, listen, they are going above and beyond in terms of their dedication to the Lord and their willingness to sacrifice like out of their means and wealth to him. Because here's the crazy thing, like when you understand like how big a sacrifice a bull is besides physically, okay? In the world, like, like if you were to go back into like Leviticus and read about priestly laws and sacrifices and stuff like that, one of the things that you discover was, like this is how big a sacrifice a bull was, a bull was what a priest offered for the sins of the nation. Like not my household, like everybody in Israel. And so they're going like above and beyond in terms of what they're going to give to God. Like same way, like when it comes to like the, the flour, okay, um, this is literally like it's 22 liters of flour. We can go further, right? Like when it talks about like how much wine is being brought, it's it's actually it's it's like so big, like like when it talks about like a skin of wine, the baby gets it. Uh, it like like when it's talking about like a skin of wine, it's like a, a filling of a tub. Guys, we have an amazing lobby. Let me just tell you that. Um, and the and the speakers actually like pump the message out into there, so it's awesome. And we got coffee too; it's great. So look, um, we have this. By the way, we're parents; we get it. All good, little man. Like, can we give it up for him? Because he's awesome. So glad to bring your son to the house of the Lord today. Yeah. Yeah. My brother, I feel you. Let me, let me tell you one time, I was, I was in a movie, and my, my one-year-old would not stop losing his mind. And Pastor Bert said some words that uh, no baby should hear. Um, been there. So, look. That they bring in this, like, full, like, bath. Like, I mean, it's basically a, a bath of wine. And here's the idea. And I just want you to know this, Okay. Because, because, like, when we talk about, like, the heart behind giving and when we talk about, like, the heart behind, okay, I'm going to entrust to God what I have. I'm going to choose to place him above everything that I have. You may notice as a church that we don't take an offering. And we do that because we never want anybody to be under compulsion to give. Like, we never want to pressure you into that. But if you understand the right heart of giving, this is something that we say here over and over and over again in terms of how we give our time, our resources, our energy, and our money. It's simply this. And we learned this from people like Hannah and her husband. We, we say it like this. We give God our best, not our leftovers. All right. Well, in terms of like a general rule of life, okay, like the way that I structure my life, the way that I prioritize things, I give God my best, not what I have left over. It's not, okay, listen, God has blessed me with a paycheck this week, and I'm going to spend it all on me, and if I have a little bit left over, I'm going to tip God. No. That's why, okay, like for me personally, okay, I take my, like my, my tithe, my 10%, like as I believe, like I'm under, I'm under conviction to give, and before I spend anything else, I set that aside to give to the Lord. All right, like when it comes down to my time and my energy, it's not, okay, if I've got enough time, then maybe I'll go to church. If there's enough space between my, no, no, because the Lord gets my best. First Sunday of the week, first hour, or he's mine, and I'm all about him. We give God our best, not our leftovers. It's not if I, you know, I'm not sleepy, so I guess I'll go. 11 o'clock service has no excuse for that, by the way. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Look. And this is what we see, all right? We, we see that, like, this is the heart. Okay, like, Lord, you're what my life is about. It's all yours. And so they, they do this. They sacrifice, and it says this in verse 25. It says, when the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, who was the priest. And she said to him, talking about Hannah, and she said to him, um, but, uh, cool, all right. <laughs> Getting loose. Pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you 
praying to the Lord. Remember that story last week? She was there. She's praying, but she's silently, and Eli thinks she's drunk. Remember that whole thing? All right. It says, I prayed for this child, this one right here with me, okay? And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. So I listen. Here he is. Here he is. And so that's exactly what happens. She leaves her son there, and Samuel grows up in the house of the Lord, ministering with Eli. He stays there. Um, and now it's at this point, okay, here's this, this boy who's the next generation, that the author of 1 Samuel begins to sort of juxtapose, put in contrast, Eli's actual sons, who were just, I'm going to say it, the worst. All right? And so... Um, let's go back for a second, guys. So here's what it says in 1 Samuel uh, 2.12. It says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. They did not know the Lord. And I like the way the ESV translates that um, because it's one of these things where, okay, what we see from the outset, like these guys are going to commit some ministry sins like crazy. And what it comes out of is not just they weren't serious enough. It comes out of they didn't know God. And I'd like to bring that up, okay, because we're talking about, all right, like how could Ravi do this? Like, how could Ravi, like, know Jesus and live this double life of abuse? Well, because Ravi didn't know Jesus. Like, I'm sorry. Like, Jesus said you'll know a tree by its fruit. And if that's the fruit, he didn't know Jesus. And there's a difference between struggling with sin and serial predatory behavior. Here's these guys, all right, like, you know, maybe, like, maybe, like, you grew up in church like I did, but here's where it's different for you. You suffered abuse at the hands of a ministry leader, and you're like, how could a person know God and do that? Well, the answer is that person didn't know God. Well, that seems really harsh, because, you know, like, but the one without sin cast the first time. There's a difference, man. There's a, like, and I can say this, okay, I, I'm in ministry. I understand better than most the humanity of ministry leaders. I get that we're jacked up at points. I get that we need Jesus as much as everybody else. And you should like, like you're like looking at me and you're like, Bert has it all together. Nope. <laughs> my gift is teaching. That'll make me better than you. Like, my gosh, how many weeks did I come in here and I'm like, God, you want me to talk to them? Like, I understand that there's this, like, yes, we're in the process of being redeemed and transformed to be more like Christ. There's a difference between, if I could just say it like this, there's a difference between a struggle and open rebellion. Okay? And so you have these two guys, Hophni and Phinehas, and what they do, their, their, their sin is threefold. Here's what they do, okay? Uh, number one, they, like, so their, their practice is priests, and they're under a different covenant, so it's about people sacrificing animals. That's not what we're under as New Testament Christians. Don't kill anything like that. Like, it's not going to make you right with God. And I'm not saying don't hunt, but it's, you, you get it. So look, all right. <laughs> like, well, is it a sin to not be vegan? Get out of the church. So look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please don't email me. <laughs> so here's what they're doing. Number one, pe when people are bringing their sacrifices to offer to God, what's supposed to happen is uh, they're supposed to offer the parts that have fat and burn that up, and they're supposed to boil it. And what should happen is the priests, like this is how the priests make their, like they, they're provided for. What, what's left over after the sacrifice from this boiled meat, the priest should stick a fork in the bowl and take the meat, and that's how they'll feed their family. But Eli's sons, Eli's sons go, yeah, but that doesn't taste as good as the fatty parts. And so you have people who are going to church to offer to God, and they're like, yeah, give us the fat parts. And don't boil it yet. We'll grill it later. And, and, and that's okay. Abuse, right? But then they take it a step further because you have some people who are like, hold on, that's not what the Scriptures teach. At which point Eli's sons bully people through their followers. And they go, well, listen, well, if you're not going to do it, forget it, and they'll take it by force gets worse. Eli's sons also, when we talk about them not knowing God, the full propensity of that, the other thing that they do, and this is just nuts, is okay, there are women who, what they do is they minister at the, the entrance of the tent. These are women who have dedicated their lives to God, and Eli's sons start sleeping with them. 
And I think this is crazy because if I were to think about every sort of ministry scandal where, where somebody has been removed from leadership, and I would say rightfully so, it normally re- revolves out of one of those three things that Eli's sons did. Okay, it either comes down to they're bullying people, they're stealing, or sex. Like, it's one of the three. Like, can you think of somebody who's been removed where it wasn't one of those things? Like, it's either, like, you got a, a leader who strong arms people, and when they're held accountable, like, they fight back in ungodly ways, or um, they're stealing from the church. Like, what's been entrusted, like, what people have given out of their good heart and good faith, they abuse that to get themselves, like, a diamond watch or something. Or you, they're, they're sleeping with their sisters or somebody else in the church. Like, it's normally, okay, it's either, either bullying stuff or sex. And Eli's sons, all three of the above. Why? Because they didn't know God. And as we're hearing about this, the author of 1 Samuel takes that story and he goes, but let me tell you what Samuel was doing. And it says in 1 Samuel 2, 18, it says, but Samuel, versus the sons of Eli, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Uh, why is that important, like the detail of the linen? Um, it's linen, like when you go through the Bible, it's a symbol of purity, like when, there are times where like it'll, there'll be stories of angels appearing and it'll describe them as wearing linen. And so the idea is like that, that Samuel is not corrupted like Eli's sons. It says each year, I love this story, each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. So you got little Samuel and he sees his mom once a year. I haven't forgotten you. And she brings him this robe. And if you were to look at it and sort of put that together, you know what it's, it's describing him as being dressed like? A little priest. And I think that's interesting. Look, I got, have you noticed, those, those of you with kids, have you noticed how much your kids sometimes, do you just do this? They like to dress up as the person they want to be. You know what I'm talking about? Like you, you go to a little league game, right? And they're wearing the uniform, man. They don't have the talent of the major leagues, but they act like they do, you know? My guys, my guys right now, are in, like, we got them into jujitsu, right? Because why not? I felt like they couldn't hurt me enough, so <laughs> not a problem anymore. Brought them home, first, first time, like, we were leaving jujitsu. My son, Luke, from the back, he just goes, I have found my sport. <laughs> All, right. All right. So we gave a little bit of time. Side, all right, they don't need to wear their sweatpants anymore. We got them, like, the, the gis, the karate gis, you know, with the belt. And, uh, we couldn't get them to take the darn things off. Like, they're just wearing them all around the house all the time. Because kids, sometimes what they do is, like, where their heart's at, they love to just pretend that that's where they are. Okay, and when it comes to Samuel, here's this little guy. And all he wants is to serve God. And he's dressed that way. He's dressed up like this little priest. Okay, so you got Eli's sons, don't care about their calling, don't care about, like, what's been entrusted to them. They're just, you know, they're squandering it. And then you've got this little guy here who's just this beacon of purity. And so time goes on. And one day, this unnamed prophet walks up to Eli's, or Eli himself. And he goes, listen, the Lord has a word for you for what's going on in your family. And this is powerful. This is what he says in 1 Samuel uh, 2, 29, so the prophet says, he says, like God speaking through him, why do you honor your sons more than me? Just let that sit for a moment. Why do you honor your sons more than me? Like, why is it about keeping them happy more than serving me? By fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering made by the people of Israel. And now we're learning something. We're learning that Eli, in his complacency, even though, like, you read through the story, Eli tells us, it's like, gosh, you need to knock it off, but he does nothing about it, okay? Now their sin is bleeding into Eli. He's eating the stuff that they stole. Like, and so here's what, what God basically says to the prophet. He goes, your family's all gonna die. I'm gonna wipe them all out, all right? And I'm gonna bring in a priest who will actually care about me and care about my people, Okay, like, like if, if you, like, if this is where you're going to be, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in somebody, I'm going to raise up somebody who will minister before me. And now the stage is set. And so, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says this. 
the boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, you, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. I love this verse 10. And the Lord came and stood there. Dag on. Calling as the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. And this is normally where the story cuts off for most of us. Like, if, if you watch the Sunday school version, this is right where it ends. But here's now the context. Verse 11, and the Lord said to Samuel, see, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At that time, I'll carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. son. So Samuel takes that and lays back down. And he's like, you want me to say what? <laughs> I'm just paraphrasing going forward. They get, they get up in the morning. He's like, he's like, so what did he say to you? And Samuel's afraid to tell him. And Eli's like, don't hold anything back. Goes, all right. He tells him all of it. And I, and I think it's interesting, like Eli's ma maturity at that moment, because what he basically says is, well, He's the Lord. Let him do what seems right to him. And that's exactly what happens. There's a battle, and we'll talk about that battle next week. Um, and in that battle, both Eli's sons are killed. And then, like, news comes forward about how the battle's going. Eli hears it. He's, he's reclining in a chair, and when he hears it, he's so shocked. He falls back as an old man breaks his neck, dies. Done. Like, just in that moment, just done. And we go, okay, well, what do we take away from that? I think there's actually, there's three things. In the time that we've got left, I want to just really quickly outline three things that I think we need to pay attention to that the, that the text teaches us. Number one, and you should just know this, one, God hates religious abuse. Hates it. Like ab above and beyond most things. Let's pay attention to the fact that the people that Jesus primarily rebukes in the Gospels are religious leaders. And I would say that to you, listen, if you've grown up in church and, man, like somebody just overstepped something with you and they hurt you, you need to know they were 100% in the wrong. It is never okay for a religious leader to act in those inappropriate ways. I like just personally speaking, when, when I hear this stuff, my skin crawls. And I just believe there's a special place in hell for people who take advantage of God's people. I just do. What they did wasn't okay. And what we learn from this passage, by the way, is that God sees it and he's going to do something about it. Hey, okay, we've lost count at this point of how many religious leaders God has brought down. But I want you to catch that. God brought them down. Like during COVID season? Like, I don't look at the situation of all this refinement that's taking place within the family of God and be like, where's God and all that? Go, there he is. 
There he is, because God's about to do something through his people. And the wicked can't stand with it. So that's the first thing. God hates religious abuse. I just want you to know that. Number two, and this is what you need to know, because most of us aren't religious leaders. Lead your family. Lead your family. The sin of Eli is he sees what his sons are doing, and he does nothing about it other than, gosh, you need to knock it off. Well, hey, first of all, aren't you their father? Number two, you're, you're a priest who outranks them, so even if you're not going to play the dad card, you can and should remove them as priests. And he keeps his mouth shut. Let me say this in an era where it's all about, like we get so sidetracked thinking we're just giving our kids good things, but the problem is that the things outweigh our love for our kids. You need to understand something. You are not your kid's friend. You're not. Like, you know, like, I just want him to have what I, well, I never had, and, and, you know, like, all the kids are getting new iPhones. Bro, he's four. <laughs> like, like, he can barely write the alphabet. Who is he texting? <laughs> and how many people, what they, they, they want their kids to think they're cool. They want their kids to just shut up. And so what they do is they never discipline. Let me tell you what the scriptures teach about this. Proverbs 13, 24, it says, whoever spares the rod hates their children. But the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. You got to put your foot down. Hey, no is not a four-letter word. And how many times do, um, how many times do we have this experience? I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to harp, okay? But I'm going to. Talk with the parent who they've done nothing to model godliness. They've done nothing to infuse faith into the lives of their kids. The kids know nothing about the scriptures. They, they, they come to church maybe once a quarter or twice a year. They didn't have a good time, so we're leaving. Why are you letting the kid drive the boat? And then they're shocked when their kid becomes a teenager and acts like somebody who hasn't been raised with faith. And they want us to fix it. And it gives me a migraine. Mom, Dad, that's on you. Like, who's making a relationship with Jesus the priority of your family and the thing that you teach your kid? Like, when we talk about this idea of, okay, I'm going to put God first. I'm going to give him my best, not my leftovers. Not if I, like, if I have time, we'll go. If we have time, we'll read a devotion together. If we have time, we'll pray together. No, no, he's first. He gets my best. And anytime anything gets in the way of that, that thing is in the wrong. How long are we going to play at this? Because here's the crazy part with Eli's kids. It's not like it was an overnight thing. You think one day they just woke up and were like, we're priests now. You know what we can do? No, lead your family. Lead your daggone family. Last one for those, every person here, here's what you need to know. Take God seriously. Take God seriously. Let me say it like this. Um, The way that we're wired as human beings is such that familiarity brings relaxation. Right? Like the more we know people, we're comfortable putting, like letting our hair down and just relaxing and kicking up our feet a little bit. Like, you don't believe me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Those of you who have been married for a while, I can't say it, never mind. So make a fart joke. I can't do it. All right, so like, <laughs> look, you know. You weren't wearing those sweatpants when you guys were dating. So look. <laughs> and, 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 and when we talk about our personal relationship with Jesus, like, hold on a second. I just need to hear this, okay? Um, one of the great things, no, the great thing, the central point of our faith, the, the thing that we rise and fall on is the belief that God has looked at you and looked at me and he's seen everything wrong that we've ever done, every sin we've ever committed, the stuff that we'll own and the stuff that we won't. And he said, I'll forgive it. And the way that I'll forgive it, I'll send my son Jesus to live the life that they haven't. 
and he'll die in their place. He'll suffer the wrath that they deserve. We believe at our core at the gospel of God's grace that we've, done, that we've done nothing to earn God's favor. That him from his kindness, he, that he's given it to us. And praise God for that. That you and I can have a personal relationship with Jesus that rests completely on God and his kindness and not our works. Okay? The problem is that for many of us, when we hear about this grace, we go, grace, yahoo. And we lose reverence for God. Out of this understanding that doesn't rest on us, so we go, so, you know, what's the point? We become so comfortable with the idea of God. That, Listen, he's Jesus, my homeboy. He's Jesus, my best friend. He's daddy God. And yes, all of those things are true, um, but he's also king. He's also king. Here are the sons of Eli, and they're so used to the office of priest. They've, they've grown up around it, like with all this God stuff that they don't, they don't have the respect for it and they don't have the reverence for it. And so they'll just treat it however they want because, because they go like this, and here's where many of us are. We think, okay, well, God will understand. Or God doesn't care. You know, it's, it's what I want. Like, God doesn't care. You know, <laughs> listen, okay, like, but at the end of the day, like, why, why shouldn't we take the best parts of the meat? It's not like God's eating it. We're just bring it up. What a waste. So I'll take it for me. For you, okay, well, like, well, well, I mean, like, doesn't God have bigger things to do than blank, than care about this, than, than care about that? Well, I mean, like, God doesn't care. And right there is your callousness of heart. You, you've stopped understanding that, no, he's the king, and it's all about him. And, yes, that king is graceful, and, yes, that king loves you, and, yes, that king wants to forgive, save, and change, and heal you. But at the same time, you need to take him seriously. In all of our informality here, and we work as a church to create a space where if you have no background in church, if you don't own a nice suit, first of all, I'm in that boat with you. I got mine at Target. Look, I wear it to weddings and funerals, and that's it. Okay. And, and we really, like, we, really like, we, we care more about what God is doing inside than how you look on the outside. Yeah. But in all that informality, you need to take God seriously. And you need to go, listen, okay, it's not, it's not about, okay, like, well, because God doesn't care about the outside, then it doesn't matter what's going on on the inside, and, it, and, and my actions don't matter. No, they absolutely do, because your actions affect more than just you. In, in all of our language of, okay, it's just me and God, well, yes, spiritually, in terms of your salvation, it is, but in the way that your life is being lived out, it's not just you and God. It's not. Like, if it was, you'd be dead, you'd be gone. The moment you receive Jesus, poof, you're gone. But it doesn't work that way. As he molds you to become more like Christ, you carry forward the kingdom of God on this earth. And you need to take with absolute fear and trembling the seriousness of that, that you are an ambassador of Christ. You need to give thought to your steps. You need to give thought to your ways. You need to give thought to your witness. And the reason you do that is not because of how great you are, but who you represent and who you say forgave you. And I would tell you this, never be so comfortable as to lose reverence for God. Do you know why, like, tears stream down my face and I get on my knees when I think about how much God has forgiven me? It's because I know who he is and who I am and how much I don't deserve who he is. And it wasn't because God was like this kindly old grandfather who's just like, ah, kids, they're going to do what they're going to do. No, he saw the severity of your sin. He saw the severity of mine. And he said, I'm going to wipe it away anyway. Never lose sight of the fact that God is a great king, the great king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And to do so is to do so to your own destruction. If I could just say it like this, don't play games with God. Don't play, well, I might give this up later. Oh, I might move out later. Oh, I might stop going to this thing later. Oh, I might, so like, no, no, why? Well, you're not guaranteed later. Eli's sons weren't, oh, can I just go there? How long will you play games with your salvation and spit in the face of the one who says, I love you and I forgave you? No, 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 no. Take God Seriously, he loves you. Yes, you can't do anything to earn that love. It is free. He will gladly give it to you. But you need to treat that with awe, fear, and trembling as the most precious thing that you'll ever be entrusted. If somebody were to hand me a Stradivarius violin, 
I wouldn't try to juggle with it. Because I don't juggle. How many of us, we've been given the most valuable thing a person can be given, and we treat it like it's common? So with that note, let me pray for us. Father, we as a people right now stop. We turn our hearts, our minds, our lives, and our bodies to you. Lord, right now, for my brother or my sister who in this moment is feeling convicted and is like, oh my gosh, Lord, what have I done? Lord, I pray where conviction ends, you bring life. Because you're bringing this up, not because you hate them, but because you care about them. Because you want to spare them from where their actions are taking them. Somebody just needs to hear this say, this is not a preacher wagging his finger at you talk. This is a God ridiculously loves you talk and cares about where you're going. Father, we as a people, we're not gonna, we're not gonna make excuses for our sin. We choose to own right now, I did wrong. It wasn't somebody else's fault. It wasn't because mom wasn't there for me enough or dad wasn't there for me enough or if, I, like, if you understood, then, I, then it would be okay. Like, like Lord, we just own it. Okay, I did wrong. Me. And we as a church body choose to collectively repent of our sin because it's that very sin, Jesus, that, that brought the necessity of your blood being shed on our behalf. Lord, right now, we as a people choose to stop and go, all right, you know what? We're going to take you seriously. Because you are worthy of that and then some. Just right now, while, while you're praying in this room, okay? Maybe some stuff just spring into mind. Where you're like, you know what, Lord? Gosh, I, I don't even know my next step with this, but, I, but this isn't right. I, I want you just to, as a, as a step of faith right now, just... Right, right here, but between you and God, okay, if there's stuff that springs to your mind, let's just assume maybe for a second that's the finger of the Holy Spirit pressing down on your heart. And your next step is simply just, like, just as an act of surrender, just stick your hands out in front of you and say, Lord, here, I give it to you. Show me my next steps. Lord, I want you to be number one in my life. I give this to you now in Jesus' name. And I thank you for the blood of Jesus covering my sin. That he's died for me and rose for me, and through him I can have new life. In Jesus' name I pray.